Welcome to the Insight Through Experience podcast, a podcast created to provide information about what life is like inside the most specialized special tactics organization in the U.S. Air Force. In these episodes, we'll be bringing you the experiences from many of our experts, ranging from our human performance optimization staff, our combat mission supporters, as well as our special warfare operators. Our main objective with these podcasts are to provide the listener with a unique look inside our culture of excellence. Now sit back, relax, take some notes, prepare to hear from some of the Air Force's finest. Thank you for joining us on the Insight Through Experience podcast. All right, welcome back to the Insight Through Experience podcast, everybody. This episode, once again, we had the privilege to go down to the Pararescue Schoolhouse. Uh, They just graduated 20 plus new PJs and one crow. Uh, We got to talk to them for about an hour and a half um, the day before they graduated. Uh, This time, I got to take three operators with me who all had great experience and and relate a lot of that to to the graduates. So it was a good time, and I think this the information that they provide in this episode uh, will be really helpful to some of y'all out there, no matter what you do for a living, but especially if you are in a 1Z career field or a 19Z career field and you are looking for your next job. Uh, the information in here describing um, what life is like at the 724 will be very beneficial for a lot of you. So we had Jordan. Jordan's a PJ. Um, he graduated PJU, he said, about six years ago. So he's been at the unit here for about four of those years. Um, man, he's got a really good sense of what it takes to be a PJ and what it takes to be a PJ up here. And he describes that very well. Then we have... Um, Nick. Nick is an officer. He's a crow. He's been up here for about five years now, and he came from the 48th RQS, um, which was his first assignment before he came here. And then we have Chuck. Chuck is the senior enlisted leader over at the 2-4 STS here. And um, man, he's been here for a minute. He's been here for about 13, 14 years. And he came from the 38th RQS, which was also his first assignment. And then I didn't say it with Jordan, but Jordan came from the Guard, and uh, he came from Moffitt out in California. So kind of a unique thing. I think he's the only enlisted guy that I've ever known here from Moffitt. Um, We've had one officer come here from Moffitt as well. Uh, High performers coming from California. So it was good to have these three guys here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, As always, there are some life lessons to learn from listening to these experienced dudes. All right, Chuck, let's start with you. So what units did you go to after the pipeline when you left here? And what was that life like as you integrated? So I left here, went straight to Moody Air Force Base, 38th. I know several of you guys going there. Uh, uh, back then, it was uh, that was like Hurricane Katrina time frame. So it was like, hurry up, get there, don't take leave, maybe get some action. So that's exactly what I did. Didn't take leave, went straight there with my, my boys. and. Uh, got a little bit of action for that one and a couple others. So a couple of civil stars worked with NASA. Um, it was a lot of old hats at the time. I want to say old hats, like some of those guys who were on the tail end of Vietnam, kind of in charge. You know, they're kind of setting their ways. Um, it was a different time frame. Um, but what happened for me, and one of these, um, one of the factors for me wanting to go up to the the two four was we had a leadership change. The chief, the DO, and the op soup all came in from the 24th and it was like the wind went 180 like that place was amazing it was badass we instead of being asked why are you doing that you know we don't do things that way because this is the way it's always been it was the complete opposite it was they were pushing us to do more to experiment to to push the push the edge push the envelope Um, it was it was an incredible experience Um, they empowered us to do more to lead um, to get to get after it frankly Chuck, before we leave you, what's one piece of advice you would give them um, as they get to the first unit to be successful? You guys do feedback? Like in your face, 360 feedback, talk about what's wrong? Don't ever lose that. When you get to your first unit, get your expectations up front. If your team leader, whoever, uh, your boss doesn't give you that, like they owe that to you. Like ask for that, like get that feedback, get that started, make that a routine Um, and get it back too. like, Like I said earlier, like some people are set in their ways. They don't think things can be made better. They just need to be the way they've always been. And that's wrong because we'll never get better if we're doing things the way they've always been. Awesome. Jordan, over to you. Where did you go after you left here? And uh, what was it like to integrate? 
I graduated in 2018. I went to Moffitt, came off the street. Um, so I was kind of always a Moffitt kid. Um, spent three years there. Uh, it was great because I basically went back to the family that I kind of started with. Um, I got two deployments right away. One at Al-Assad in 18 for four months, just standard CSAR deployment. And then uh, in 19, I got to augment the 24th and basically doing the torch rotation. Biggest reason why I decided to come up to the 24th and assess was I got to see behind the curtain, especially like setting up and getting containment on a house and they go and assault it. It's something you don't see every day in rescue and you're just like, this is, this is next level. Um, that and then caliber of guys that you're working around. They're just, everyone is handpicked. Everyone wants to be there. Um, they're chomping at the bit just to make the middle of the pack. That's kind of the, the saying around where we're at. It's, you're always working your ass off just to stay in the middle. What uh, what's a piece of advice you'd give them as they get to the first unit? Uh, double tapping with, with Chuck. Feedback is huge. It's a push-pull. If your team leader, troop chief, whoever doesn't give you their expectations, you should, you should get them to them. Because that lets you know your left and right limits of how you're going to do business for them, uh, how you're going to work your tail off. The other thing is you guys spend a lot of time in this pipeline. Um, and it's congratulations because you're just finishing, but you're also starting. With that, you're gonna build on all your skills, your med, your ropes, extrication, you're gonna get jumping, diving. It takes time. Don't think that these skill acquisitions happen overnight. You're gonna make mistakes. Embrace that, just don't make the same mistake twice. Look for that feedback. You know, it's not gonna be comfortable, but like anything in life, it's worth it. You grow and it feels clunky and you get better. And you look back and you're like, I can't believe the changes. So it comes with some sacrifice and um, just embrace that. All right, next, some questions over to you. Where did you go when you left here, and uh, what was that experience like? So I graduated out of here in 15, uh, went to Tucson in the 48th. I uh, was there for about four years before I went up to 2-4 uh, in 19. Uh, the experience for me getting out to Tucson, um, we were still active in Afghanistan and the Jordan's Point, uh, deploying to Iraq, so I was able to kind of get the exposure of both of those. Iraq was the, the CSAR type deployment where you're questioning like, man, what are we doing? We have all these skills and we've been trained at this high level, um, but we're sitting alert or flying in 60 for six hours uh, for something that could go wrong. Uh, and then went to Afghanistan where we were a lot more involved uh, and gainfully employed. Um, and that was where like the light bulb came on. We're like, this is why I joined. Uh, everything that you've seen in the recruiting pitch or the stories that you, you've heard, um, that's where it all kind of surface level um, was in I get my face and able to see it uh, firsthand. It was a it was a good time to come in because and I had the opportunity of coming to the or getting to the unit where the guys had 15 plus years of experience uh, in that GWAT uh, and all of the lessons learned um, over those you know 15 to 20 years and we were able like myself and the new PJs able to just pick their brains and learn as much as we can. Um, obviously we're in that transition period again where we're transitioning away from GWAT into this future fight. Um, so we're all in that learning mindset again, trying to figure out how do you get after it, and that's where we need that creativity uh, to kind of push the push the boundary um, with things. What was it like officer-specific going into the 48th? Were you assistant team leader? Did you get thrown out into a TL role? What happened? So I got thrown straight into a uh, troop command position, uh, and this is kind of tying into the second question that, or the following question that Mr. Free's gonna ask. But as a new officer, as well as you guys, uh, junior enlisted, even if you're tech sergeant, I think I've seen um, some high ranking enlisted, like man, find a mentor with a senior enlisted guy that's well respected and like hold on to his pocket. Uh, you kind of heard me talk about it a little bit this morning. For me, that was Dagan Hart. Like he's like played a significant part in my development as a junior officer, kind of keeping me in check with, you know, the do's and don'ts. Uh, and then pulling me back. If every one of you guys, when you graduate, you're gonna be extremely motivated to get to your unit uh, and wanna try to change things or do something new, like, which is phenomenal. But get the historics and kind of the history from those senior enlisted, and they're gonna allow you to develop the best approach for change. Um, and in anything that you do, like when you pick that senior enlisted that you're gonna go to as a mentor, like pick somebody that's highly respected and valued. Like I'm not saying, 
Like not, not everyone's created equal, and that's just that's how it is. Uh, so find the guy that's respecting that organization, uh, use them as a mentor from your first, first duty assignment throughout your career, and that's going to have significant impacts to help you guys. Awesome, love it. Um, One absolutely. more caveat, I think Chief Cox mentioned on the tail end too, something else they thought about was never stop improving. Like, know what a standard is and continue to improve on that standard. And if there's not a standard, then you guys need to have one. You know, I know here at the schoolhouse, you guys got plenty of standards to meet, but like you should know where your standard is as far as where your benchmark is and like continue to improve on that. As a PJ, as a man, um, husband, father, operator, like, you know, keep learning. Don't just get stagnant. Jordan, starting with you, what are two, one or two traits of the successful operators at your first unit that stood out to you um, when you were there? Uh, we've already talked a lot about they're forever learners. So they weren't content with just getting their beret, you know, being in for 15, 20 years, knowing how to jump, shoot, do medicine. They were always looking to improve. And that translated their personal life with their wife, with their kids, their aspirations. Um, and the second thing was compassion. The guys who really cared, they were kind, they were humble, they cared about you, they checked in. They wanted to actually pour into you. Those are the people that you naturally are just like, I wanna be around that person, because they, they really do care. They're trying to make me better. They've lost friends. Um, they wanna make sure that I'm understanding the severity and uh, what's on the line here. And that's not to make you guys you know, afraid of making mistakes, it's just the reality of what we do is dangerous and you're gonna operate in small teams and there's gonna be a expectation you're gonna do the right thing and you're also gonna own up when you don't. So, that yeah, was a big thing. Thanks, man. Nick, let's go to you next. So, one or two traits of successful people when you got to the 48 that stood out. Driven and balanced. So, like, you guys are gonna get extremely caught up in trying to master all your skills at the same time, but there has to be a balance in what you're doing and how you're doing that. Um, for the guys with families right now, um, and you know, the guys that will have families in the future, you have to know when to turn it off, separate yourself from like striving for perfection, which is what we all do, and then being able to kind of reset. When you get hung up on like defining your self-worth with your job, that's when you start going down that slippery slope. Um, like, so having an outlet, whether it's your family, uh, hobbies, like be able to decompress and pull away. And I think the guy that, that I've been around with both at the 48 and at the 2-4 that have that balance, come in more focused. Um, they know exactly what they need to do. They're efficient. And then when it's time to break away, they, they do that. Awesome. Chuck, over to you. Passionate, driven, lifelong learner, willing to take the extra step and do more. Um, I thought back at some of the guys who uh, went ahead of me up here uh, and that's some of the traits that to find them. So Nick, let's start with you. Um, at the 48, what was the trigger? What drove you uh, to put in the application for the, the 724 to the 2-4? Yeah, so the trigger for me was honestly this brief and I'll sit in your guys' seat. Uh, the reason I joined was to do what we're doing up to the 24th. Uh, and this was part of the process to get there. Um, when it comes to like the, you know, when should I do it? Should I wait? Should I do it as soon as I can. Like, man, you're not going to learn anything or do anything at whatever unit you go, you're going to that we won't teach you at the 24th. Um, like, when you come up there and you go through OTC, you are being instructed and taught by some of the most professional, competent, and capable instructors in the Air Force. Uh, and we don't have the same limitations on our training pipeline as we do with an AEPC. So we push the boundaries. Um, so like, man, if, if it's something you're interested in, obviously there's going to be some personal factors that go into that, like push the application in as soon as you can. Um, there's nowhere else in the Air Force are you going to do what we're doing at the 24th. So if that's something that you're interested in, like, I mean, I'd, I'd highly recommend and suggest doing it. Like, and I don't, I don't give a shit if you're a senior airman. Like, if we get you sooner, we can instill how to do things right. Uh, we're not breaking bad habits, and then you got your entire career that you can build on the foundation um, with instructors from the 24th. Chuck? Kind of like I mentioned before, seeing the guys who had been up here, but also the guys who had to work on, seeing them put in the extra effort, seeing them, you know, at the end of the day as everybody's going home, they're going, getting ready to go out the track and have that second workout. 
um, seeing that kind of drive and that ambition to do more and, and you know, up to see what's over the next ridge line, um, kind of drove me to do the same. I, I wanted to see if I, if I could, you know, can I do that? Do I have what it takes? Um, and also, like, hey, um, whether you like it or not, like, you're not going to get to do the same things that the two four does in any other place in the Air Force, like, bar none. Like, it ain't going to happen. Sure. Yeah, rubbing shoulders with guys overseas and seeing how they did their job. That was a big one. And then, like Chuck just said, everything that he just described, you'll do. You'll do things that you didn't think were possible. And just because you're young or um, maybe you're a senior, and I was a senior when I assessed um, and I got selected. The point is, the right guy is going to show up and he's going to put that work in. And uh, if you want to be there, you're going to rise to the occasion. You're going to get knocked down. But that process is really going to it's not worth it to just put it off four or six years after you graduate to then come up. Um, be diligent also, if you know, you're, you know you have two years, whatever the case is, because you're hamstrung by logistics or your command, man, get your five levels. Don't just wait around and expect, I'm gonna be a physical specimen. Like, it's more, it's between your ears. That's, that's what we hire guys for. It's physical fitness, it's stress tolerance, it's communication, it's what's between your ears. You gotta work on that stuff, acquiring those skills gain those confidence, making those mistakes. All of us on the stage, we've made so many mistakes. And the reality is we've been successful because in the moment we can pivot when we know we're making a mistake or someone else's and we can delegate them before they go down that road. We know what wrong looks like so we can correct it quick. Just doing the basics all the time in really complex and dynamic situations. So keep that in mind. I think we answered this mostly already, but I'm gonna give you guys another shot at it. Just, just go if you have something to say for it. So in your own words, why should the guys come up here sooner than later? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, you know, on the last question, like, what would what would be your guys' reasoning right now? Like if you're sitting in the seat and you're one, thinking about, do I do it? If you wanna come up, do I do that my first time? Do I do it my second? Like, what are some of the questions you guys have? And maybe we can kind of dig into that a little bit. Well, yeah, I definitely exactly. wonder, you know, like how much um, experience is necessary to be successful at that selection. Yeah. Like, uh, how much of it is skill based uh, and how much of it is like attribute based. And I can give every one of you guys the playbook of what selection looks like right now. Um, you know exactly what we're going to do. Like, both selection and OTC, like, we're not there to take you down or play mind games. Um, it's very straightforward. Uh, there's no skill based. Um, portions in our assessment selection, like we're hiring based off of attributes. Because if we're picking you up and you are exceeding the standards that we have for those attributes, then we know we can train you. We know you have, kind of like what Jordan was saying, like in between the ears, you have the mindset. Um, so everything we do, like we're not trying to, um, to trick you to play games throughout OTC or ANS. Um, but like, going back to what I said, the skill base, like we will get you there because we're hiring people that we have seen based on the attributes, have the skill that we need to, to train. Going to the guys on the stage who I know we've all suffered through some marriage um, challenges up there, what's that like for the guys? It's gotta be a joint decision. Like, I've, I mean, she, in my class, there were people who kind of tricked their spouses to coming up, and if they didn't know what they were getting into, you probably knew who I'm talking about. Uh, and it was a surprise. That marriage obviously didn't last very long. So if you don't like your marriage, sure, go, go that route. But make it a joint decision, like don't hide anything, be straightforward. But um, on the flip side, like I, I'm i obviously biased, but I don't think anybody has the same support structure and, and uh, tools that we do. I think we do a very good job of taking care of our people and our spouses. Um, also, when you're home, you're home. Like we take care of that too. We, we, we do recognize time is precious. Um, and when it comes to like the dangerous things, like, yeah, we do dangerous things, but we also do it with the best people in the world, right? You are working with the absolute best people in the world at, at those skills and those things they do. So that's how we mitigate the risk. Like you're flying with the best helicopter pilot that's on the planet. You're going on missions with the people who are the absolute best in the world at that, that skill set. So um, that's one thing that actually has, my wife has recognized and it's actually bought down that, that worry for her is like, all right, I know he's going with the best, so. I think so for me, it goes back to what I said earlier um, with the driven and balanced. Like, you have some ownership in that too when it comes to um, marriages, like ones that I've seen fail and ones that are 
uh, probably stronger than ever uh, based off of what Chief said with the resources that we have um, at the, the 724. Uh, and then kind of tugging on the, the risk thing, like nobody else in the Department of Defense gets tasked directly from the President or the SECDEF to go out and do these missions. So like, we don't go into a fight unless like we have the advantage. So when we say we need things to mitigate risk for X, Y, and Z, like that's what that's what we're getting. Um, so everything that we do, we're very strategic and methodical about how we do it to bite on risk. Um, and really like another thing that I want to drive home, like the thing that we value most in our organization is the people. Because without the people, we cannot like we can't do the mission. So if you're going through a patch with your marriage where you have to kind of come off the line for a short time and kind of re-solidify that or build that foundation up, like we're able to do that. And thankfully, because of the people that are in the unit, like other people will make sacrifices to fill in, to, to cover down, to allow you to kind of build that up. Now, if it becomes a, a habit and a standard, like maybe the 24th isn't the, the best spot for it, um, but I'm not blowing the smoke up your ass when I say like, we value the people. Uh, more than anything, because without them, like there is no point for it. The only reason I'm still there is the people. We have the absolute best yep. people in the entire DOD, promise you that. Let's just talk about the timelines real quick. Guys um, are getting orders up to a year to a year and a half early now. What does that mean? That means when FPC drops orders on you, we can no longer pull you up to selection without your career field managers getting involved, your chief getting involved, and it's a whole process. When you leave here, you have to take control of your career and understand when those timelines are so you don't miss the opportunity to come up here um, because you get orders to Canon and they're like, man, everybody hates Canon, so we're going to send you there. We're not going to let you go to the 724. You can take control of that by coming up before those orders drop, and then we get to protect you um, with AFPC until we make a decision on you. That's power. That's the power you have. You take it away from yourself and us when you miss that timeline and you get orders dropped and then you want to come. AFPC, then we have a fight and we don't always win those, all right? So keep that in mind. Take control of your career because the Air Force is just going to put a body in a seat. That's what they're looking to do. They're looking to fill manpower. Um, AFPC is the only fight that we go into. It's not fair. This is the, <laughs> we are the only <laughs> force. Yeah, and we usually go in under him. <laughs> Love it. All right, guys. So let's, Nick, could you, we're going to switch into um, the operator training course. So when you get selected to our ANS model, and we can talk about, we can mix that in here a little bit, but when you get selected, you're going to then PCS and come up for a nine-ish month training course that I'll let Nick um, describe because he, he owns it. Um, questions that you should be asking as he's describing this is, why nine more months? Man, I'm a highly trained dude. I'm a, probably a five level by this time. Why in the hell do I need nine more months? Right. So Nick, if you could just walk us through what your guys do for OTC. And yep, so I'll kind of start uh, all the way to begin to ANS, put your application in. I'll bring you out, you go through the ANS process. Uh, if you get hired, from there we'll kind of slot you, um, depending on availability with how uh, the shred outs look, with how many PJs you have for the next coming OTC, as well as timing. So if you come towards the end of, like let's say December uh, ANS, you probably won't roll into that OTC that's starting that summer, or probably fall into next summer, just based off the timing of PCS's, AFPC and some of that stuff. Uh, once you get in, we'll PCS people in the summer, we usually try to get you out there um, at the latest, June 1st. You'll have that whole month to kind of get house hunting, get settled in, make sure your wife uh, is, is set up, your kids are uh, good to go to school. And then OTC will start in July um, every year. So what we're doing is we're starting after the fourth holiday weekend. So that way guys have kind of one last um, weekend with their family before uh, the machine starts. Uh, OTC, like Mr. Free says, nine months. Uh, and from start to finish, like you're fucking busy. Um, how it's broken out right now, so the first third of OTC is where all the shred outs stay together. So PJs, controllers, FPs, they're all going through just core soft skills. Um, so we do baseline of skill familiarization, just get everybody um, baseline on what we're looking for uh, moving out. Uh, you go into flat range shooting for a couple weeks, after flat range shooting, you go into CQB, it's about a month long. After CQB, we do mission planning. So like the task force type mission planning, go into tactics and FMPs. And then after that block, that's soft core skills, and that's when you start breaking into block two. So we have OTC broken into three blocks. 
Block two is your first introduction to your um, core skills. So PJs will break off into their TRS type training, um, and it's a progression throughout the year. Uh, so it's you break it down 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 for tech right, so TRS and CAS. Um, so what you guys are doing your 1.0 controllers are out doing theirs. Uh, everything that we instruct in the 1.0s is a building block as we progress to the 2.0, 3.0, and then ultimately Colex at the end of OTC. Um, so we go through everything from class structure, everything that you guys have done throughout PJU, uh, just on a more complex level. Um, the resources and the, the training sites that we have and what we set up is second to none. Um, I know like some of the exposure that you guys have had on PJU is probably like, man, that's pretty impressive. Um, when we go to Guardian Center with some of the subject matter experts that we have, uh, and we're talking like pain, cars from trees, uh, with all sorts of complex shit. Um, that is what, and we're, we're building scenarios based off of operational after actions. So everything that we're training you to is either based off of a singular mission or a combination of multiple missions that have happened um, operationally. So that way you, can, you guys can start building that foundational understanding of what the guys have experienced in the field. So when you find yourself on your first deployment with the Army or the Navy, like it's like, okay, I've seen something like this before. I have the training um, to back this up and then you go into it. Awesome. Let's go with uh, Chuck to you first because you came through um, the longest ago. That's not even English, but we're going to go with it. Um, what was your experience like and how did you change? What I really want to get at is how did you change as a PJ from the time you entered OTC to the time you came out? So going into that experience, you know, I, you know, I had several deployments by that time down range and one of them was the 24th. Um, but to what uh, Nick mentioned about the caliber of training. So um, I learned to flat range shoot with a seven time world champion. And then, you know, he brushed over the, the training that you do, but the, there's no way for your brain that, to really uh, capture or think about like that level of training, I think. So the seven time world champion was the guy I shot with. And then long range shooting with Todd Hoffman who developed night force scopes and He's, he's the, you know, the Kestrel, but you guys probably know what that is. Um, just, you know, flying with the 160th uh, Guardian Center and places like that, which will just blow your mind. They have a subway system that they can fill with CS gas and run scenarios with you guys. Um, it's just mind boggling that that level of training they do because their budget is massive, our budget is massive. Um, and then what we can do with it is also massive. You've heard three level a couple of times here, and I think what Nick said earlier, I just want to drive it home. Yeah. Some of you guys going to ST, man, are not, man, it's hard to get your five level at an ST unit. It's hard. At an RQS, you're kind of a little bit more focused. Everybody has the um, FTU that you can go to now, but that isn't a guaranteed thing, right? If you're a three level and you're at an ST and you think, man, I got to stay here, I need to get this five level before I come up, put in an application and let us be the adjudicators of that if we think you're ready or not. Don't discount yourself because you still have that three level. A lot of that you don't control, all right? So let us get a vote on that before you decide. Yeah, I'll tell you right now, there's multiple guys going through OTC that are still three levels um, that have some deficiencies, and like, I don't give a shit about it. We will. We will factor that type, that type of stuff into training to ensure that they get that upgrade. Um, but don't let that be the, the reason that holds you back. Um, Cause like, man, we can we can cover down on that uh, pretty easy with the resources um, and the capability that we have. Jordan, let's go with you next. Cause I want Nick to finish this off from the officer, officer perspective of OTC. So how did OTC change you as a PJ? Um, coming from the rescue side, I was used to doing the classic mass cal, you know, extrication piece, that was the mission. When you come to the 24th, these contingencies that you guys are all heavy hitters on, that's a piece of the puzzle. That's not the mission. You're doing your piece subsequently while the assault force is still clearing. And so when you're in that training acumen and you have all these resources and experiences, you're just accelerating your capabilities to a degree that I, I really can't quantify for you because you don't realize it until you're around your friends who you graduated with and you just kind of, you're speaking another language. Um, that's how fast and far that you accelerate with your skill set. 
It's also the ability for you to understand big picture. We're not an infantry unit, we're not an infantry branch. You have that ground truth. You understand from planning to exfil and AAR, everything in between. And you learn so much more than just doing a five line. You learn about doing a concept of fires with the ISR, with strike, with cast back, with your controller. You learn how the GFC thinks, how you're solving problems for them because they have a lot of shit going on, a lot. And you are literally saving bandwidth and making his job easier while also gaining credibility and showing this is why you're here, man. You're here because you solve problems in a unique manner that most people don't see or think of. And that's, you know, that's the hat that you will, you know, wear when you come through OTC. You'll learn a lot. And I can't overstress enough. The resources, the training that you will get, no one's good at CQB at any unit, ST, RQS, it doesn't matter. You will learn how to go from learning how to rewalk in a room to them before you know it, doing live fire, multi-team, multi-breach at night in-house. And it'll blow your socks off before you first started. So just keep that in mind. If you're the right guy, you're gonna progress. That's what these guys do here. So like my job at the debt for officers is to build joint leaders. So while they're going through their shred outs, um, I'll take the officers and we'll do some, some leadership courses. We do a course up at Duke um, that goes over national policy um, at the strategic level. We'll hit on some interagency communications and embassy courses. Uh, and then throughout the entirety of the course with the FMPs, uh, like you're gonna get picked apart with the mission planning so that way you understand the, the bigger picture of what our role is in this fight, like our job is to get out and fight for the resources that these guys are saying that they need to be able to do the job. Um, and that's like, that's where we come into play is to get them what they need so we can go win the fight. Um, it's gonna be hard transition from the tier two units where you find yourself doing everything. You kind of do officer stuff. You think you're the, you, you learn to be the subject matter expert on tactics. Like when you come up to the two four, like that is a troop chief led team so the senior enlisted are running everything they oversee the training and our job is to get them what they need so like i said all the shit that you think you thought you were going to do going through pju and getting to your rescue or st units is getting to the 24 to be able to do that stuff and this is a process like we wouldn't be who we are today if we didn't go through pju and spend time with the line units and it's part of that development so when you're at the 24th you have the maturity and that foundation to fall back on so when you find yourself leading a team in you know a, a very sensitive location to get after strategic targets, you have that to fall back on. Right. Let's keep riffing though on what we're doing for two four. So Chuck, from your perspective, being the uh, senior enlisted right now, um, just riff on the two four, um, what it's like there right now, and how you're perceiving it. So talk about people. You just mentioned it, but you know when you go to the bank or to the DMV, you got the person <laughs> who tells you like, man, I don't do that job or that's not my thing or you know, customer service is a problem, like we don't have that problem. Everybody in that organization is hand selected to be there. They would drop, like if I have a problem with my computer, not because I'm the chief, if I was, you know, just a regular dude, back when I was a regular dude, they stop what they're doing, they come fix your problem, and if they can't do it, they get on the phone somebody who will. That's the level of service that you get there. Like talk about trusting people. Um, if I need a piece of equipment or if I need, you know, whatever done, Intel, whoever, from whatever enabler folks that we have, like they're gonna get the job done and not just get it done, they're gonna do it exceedingly well at a high level because that's just who we are as an organization. It's it's just a whole nother experience. It's awesome to be there. My wife makes fun of me, tells me I'm not gonna make it in the civilian world because everybody's not hand selected to work with me anymore. <laughs> She's probably right. Uh, but that experience is just something that I can only talk through. It's, it's something you have to experience to understand organization is just awesome to be a part of um, and like I said before like you know recruiters lie to you um, when to get you in the door there's some cool guy videos I mean when I joined the military it was because of a poster not the military I'm sorry when I joined Paris it was because of a poster on a wall turns out it was a combat control poster with the name PJ uh, <laughs> recruiter again he's like oh that's PJ's so here I show up watching videos and wow yeah I got to do some fun stuff it was never the stuff in the poster it was just never it was never what I was kind of promised, I thought, you know, um, which is one of the things that led me up there. I wanted to see what's behind the curtain, see what's over that next ridge line, see if I could do it. And it, you know, 
no one was lying to me. Um, I got to do it. Uh, and we're not lying to you either. Like, you come up, if you want to, you know, push the envelope, um, go experience the things with the best in the world, like, you're going to do it. What's been the best thing about the assignment since you guys have been up there? Yeah, for me, it's like, I couldn't imagine the shit that I find myself doing uh, over the past five years uh, anywhere else. Um, to your point, like some of the reservations I had is like, man, do I really want to go up um, and be an admin officer for the guys that are going out in the Army and Navy? Like, man, that thought is so far removed after the shit that I find myself doing um, that it's like, you, you really couldn't imagine it. Um, the shit you see on TV or the movies, like, man, it's on a whole different level. Um, with what goes on in the background to get you to where you're at. Um, like, I think the, the run today and what Josh said to you guys about like staying sharp, like the best way to explain it is like, we don't get to choose where crisis is gonna occur. So like, you always have to be fucking prepared because when your phone goes off and you're racing to the, to the base to get on a C-17 to go jump in or to go shoot somebody in the face like we have no idea where that's going to be it could be you know arctic environment you got to do a 5 10k offset in or it could be you know you're, you're jumping to the x like the the spread of missions that you have to be sharp both mentally and physically to do is unimaginable so like the work that you guys put in now like opportunity favors a prepared mind like you guys have to stay sharp um, because like the shit you're gonna find yourself doing up here is second to none. Yeah, they'll tap that. There's really no ceiling with what you guys get to expose yourself to at the 24th. You'll never run out of things to learn or do, you know, whether it's jumping, shooting, driving, tactics, all of the above. There's always something you'll learn. There's always something that you're trying to, based on the scenarios of today with how turbulent, our world is, there's always gonna be a place where you're not gonna go and you're gonna do things in a sensitive manner for literally at the highest level. So that's the coolest thing, man. It never ends and <coughs> there's really unlimited resources for you to tap into that. Whether that's money to train, gear, the best people that you get to work with shoulder and shoulder, the best support staff ever with our HPO, you know, taking care of your bodies, taking care of your minds, taking care of your families, they really do care. And it's, it's evident. Like, if it makes, there's, you're not put in a box when it comes to finding solutions to a problem. If that makes the most sense based off the environment, I'm like, cool, let's do it. What do we need to go get? Uh, it's like one of those, uh, one of those movies, like, hey, I need you to drive. Okay, where are we going? You know, it's like, it's that type of environment. Uh, as long as the thoughts put into it, like, uh, it's pretty endless. True. Hey, and like, don't let the lack of deployment opportunities deter you from putting your application into it. We have changed the mindset and the approach that we have on OTC. And it's not just training you, like we are mentoring, developing you, and training you because we know that you guys, the opportunities aren't out there for you to get the combat experience that guys had, you know, five, 10 years ago. Uh, and we were doing that with the instructors, um, sharing their experiences. You guys can learn from that. Uh, so you can't stay on the two series unit to go after something that's not there. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Like, don't let that be a determining factor. Of thinking like hey, I need experience before I go up to the D4. Like I don't give a shit if you don't have deployment. Again, we hire off of attributes and not what your commander says, not what your EPB or whatever says. Uh, or we don't give a shit about that. We're gonna make sure we have the right guy, um, regardless of experience. What I want to do is throw out the questions here, and then we'll wrap it up. I know you guys have family in town, so we don't want to stay up here all day but I want to give you guys tons of opportunity to ask questions and let these guys round out more information as, as that comes. Yes, sir, regarding expectations, you spoke a lot on games and things like that. What can we expect from a traditional RPS student I'm going to be in right now as far as uh, time away, managing expectations, talk about why because this is something I'm obviously interested in and um, I've always known that, hey, managing expectations up front really helps out. Are you asking about DM or our place? That's uh, people. Okay. So for the OTC perspective, I'll kick it over to the Chief Fox 24. So we, we've revamped how we approach OTC so that block one, as opposed to us going TUI for the first two and a half months, all that is done home station now. So all of our shooting, uh, CTV, tactics, mobility, all that stuff is done uh, at Bragg. Uh, 
the second half of the season where it picks up. So pretty much from July to October, you're home. Um, October is when you get to the shutouts. You'll be on the road for those. Uh, November, you go to Campbell to work for 160th. December, you're in Miranda for free fall. Uh, January, you're home. And then February, March, it ranks back up because uh, we end in April with the cold ice. So that's kind of overview of OTC. And one thing I want to hit on too, uh, we didn't talk about it. You guys might've heard in the past, but like, hey, you come up with before we stay forever. Like, man, there are cases where guys stay longer than others, but like, man, we're in the world now to where the units you guys are going to are also hurting for uh, experienced individuals to come back and develop the force. And then that experience has come from the 24. So like, be an honest broker, like just because you get picked up and hired the 24th doesn't mean you're gonna stay there for 16 years. Um, what it does mean is that we have the opportunity to bring you back if you do leave. Um, you know, there was the, the time where that was the stand, like the standard where everybody stayed. Yeah. Um, but like guys are coming in, I think with that perception of like, oh, I'm never gonna fucking move again. Um, fortunately, like going back to the AFTC thing. And well, push several guys out. Yeah. And you know, group field managers, uh, they're still in need to send guys back to 48, 38 overseas units to share that experience and really be the, the recruiters for the T4. Um, but like, man, it, it's it's not a forever thing, which is also good. Like, you, it's fucking busy, uh, high ops tempo. Um, so if that's something that your you know, your wife's concerned about, like, you know, you can bounce out after after your time and come back after the reset, like whatever, whatever it may be. All right, Jordan, we're gonna start with you, then we'll go with um, Chuck, then we'll be able to close it out. Final okay. question. Congratulations to all of you guys. Obviously that's, you should have said out at the front end, but you know, I blinked and I was in your seat and six years later, now I'm sitting on the opposite side. So it goes by fast, man, cherish the moments. Uh, like I said, the people, your guys' a team, big team. You guys may not see each other for a minute, I went years before I saw my teammates. Um, but like check in with them, man. I'm like, you guys are boys. I can tell that from just doing the run. You guys are pushing each other, you guys care. It's very evident when you're an outsider kind of looking in. So no matter what you do in this career field or where you go, you still have your life outside of this place. You know, you still have your family and your friends. You're still a human being, you're still American. So, you know, cherish these moments because life's fragile. Um, and you know, Get everything you got, you know, that cliche movie quote, but you know, it's gone before you know it. Um, and enjoy the ride now. Congratulations, like I said, on this cruise point in Alaska. This is really special. Thanks for being great Americans and answering the call. I still remember uh, the two guys who gave me this brief uh, Colon Lopez, you may know the name, and uh, Tony Negron, who now owns SCI. You guys will probably run into him at some point in your careers. These two Hispanic looking dudes in beards and suits <laughs> came and gave me this brief one day. I had no idea what the hell it was. And they're all cryptic about it too. They showed me some video and then talked for a little while. I was weird. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully this sits in the back of your mind as something that's available out there. Like I said, no plus opportunities one day. Yeah. And then, all right, last thing I'll leave you guys with. Uh, again, congrats. Like not many people uh, in the military or nation have gone through what you guys have gone through as a team. Like there's something to be said for that. Uh, but don't get complacent. Like as you guys go to your next unit, uh, if you want to come up to assess, like and always strive for excellence, but knowing like we're never going to get there. Um, complacency is what's going to get yourself hurt, um, get yourself killed, or somebody else uh, injured or killed. So continue to drive and strive for that perfection, knowing that we're never going to achieve it, um, and keep up the good work. Hope to see you guys uh, come up to, to assess.